Good morning, good morning, Twin Cities. This is your unbougie foodie, Wesley Wright. Checking with, the, checking with, checking in, I should say, <laughs> with with you all this morning. Uh, it's a holiday season. People are probably away traveling, but if you're doing so, I hope that you're either. You've downloaded the TuneIn app so you could catch the show and any other shows that follow, like Doing Good With Food with Dr. Turner Berg. So shout out to Dr. Turner Berg. Always having having a conversation about uh, really serious major events uh, and you know his organization and the different chefs that he has on the show. So shout out to him. But... This is my show, The Unbougie Foodie, and again, I want to thank you for tuning in this morning. It's a little brisk out there, but you know, y'all are Minnesotans, so y'all are used to this. (laughs) First and foremost, I want to encourage you to definitely call in. Remember, this is a show about food, so it's not just me talking to you about food. It really is about sharing, so... If you are a listener and you're interested uh, in maybe making a comment or have a suggestion, feel free to give a, give me a call here at the radio station. It is 651-200-3479. Once again, 651-200-3479. Um, you know, I have a number of different social medias that you could follow me on. Um, I've always talked about Facebook. But uh, there's also Instagram, which is the underscore unbougie foodie at not at, but the underscore unbougie foodie. Um, Twitter is at unbougie foodie. Uh, Maybe you want to just have a conversation. Maybe you need a suggestion Uh, offline. Feel free to also reach out to me by email. uh, And that is the unbougie foodie at gmail dot com. But maybe you don't really need to have a conversation maybe you just kind of like want to see where i've been what foods that i've been eating and so on um just make sure you go to my website as well uh, which is www.theunbougiefoodie.com and you'll be able to see definitely a number of food uh photos in the gallery as well as articles uh maybe you want to get caught up on past shows you can also do that too at the umbujifoodie.com as well so i'm putting that out there (laughs) feel free to uh, visit the website or follow me on any of the other social media so once again i just want to leave the telephone number for you so that you'll have an opportunity to call in and maybe make a comment a suggestion or just you know hey maybe you want to pass the time and talk to me that telephone number is 651-200-3479. So I want you to just sit back and your cup of coffee. Hey, maybe you, you're interested in maybe having a cup of coffee in a unbougie foodie mug. Well, I'll talk about that later or you'll see that on my website. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Maybe you're interested in some merchandise. You never know. Anyway, (laughs) I'm just putting that out there. So, you know, it's going to be a... It's never a low-key show. (laughs) But I do want to just kind of talk about, you know, a place that I've been. It's fairly in the neighborhood. Um, Let me see. I, I want to say that it's kind of like St. Anthony, St. Anthony area. Uh, well, it's it's Minneapolis. It really is. Um, but specifically, what I am talking about, or a place that I'm actually talking about, is Twin Cities 400 Tavern. Uh, Twin Cities 400 Tavern is it's a it's a nice little it's an eatery. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, it's located at 1330 Industrial Boulevard Northeast uh, Suite 400. Um, 
and you know honestly it, it it's really close by i mean right off what 36 uh and right where like 36 and 280 kind of meet yeah right around that area um certainly to find out more you could definitely visit their website but to uh, go to www.tc400tavern.com um shout out to our server his name was uh john d thanks john really helpful we went there for brunch last week sunday really awesome food i'm like uh, I, i'm just saying it was good food um, but they have a variety of different uh, menus that are available. They have breakfast, Sunday brunch, uh, lunch and dinner. And of course, they do have a kids menu. So parents, uh, it is a family friendly place as well. So don't feel that you have to be, you know, leave your kids somewhere. It's never fun, is it? Um, but I just want to talk about a few of the things that uh you know, uh, my friend Warren and I had when we were visiting um, there. Gosh, they had. Uh, I'll just say that you know we went there for brunch, and they had this uh, butter, these buttermilk pancakes, um, and you have a variety that you could choose from, which is plain blueberry, uh, banana walnut, or chocolate chip. I'm not really too much of a chocolate chip person. All the others. I could definitely do with. I wish they had strawberry, and maybe they probably could have. Um, and I even take that back because that he, that wasn't even the one that he had. He had the ricotta um, pancakes, and that was these pancakes were so delicious. Uh, and then they had a blueberry compote um, on top, and you'll have an opportunity to see that on the unbougie foodie uh, website i'll post those pictures uh up on there so that you'll be able to see gosh these the photos and me describing it really doesn't do it any type of justice it really really doesn't uh, but it was a wonderful <laughs> it was a nice big display of blueberry compote that were on like four or five uh, pancakes uh, and these pancakes were just so light and moist uh, they were just delicious I'm just gonna say that really good myself I had the uh, brioche French toast there's just something about uh, that type of bread or I just call it a pastry I really do because it's just a wonderful melting your mouth type of bread you know and then of course when it is you know done french toast style uh, and then you've poured syrup on top or you've added some butter uh, and they've added um, you know powdered sugar to that and you add your butter and then you're pouring your uh, uh, your syrup over over uh, over the to french toast i tell you your mouth is watering um, because of the aroma and the fragrance uh, that your food is just giving off. <laughs> it's, you know, like I said, words, my words don't really do it any type of justice. I would really love for you all to take a look at the photos when I have them available up online. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you'll, you'll enjoy it. I mean, just by the photos themselves, trust me. And then myself, I also had, you know, um, when you are a foodie, that's why you go in pairs or you go in a larger group. You make sure that you have a few things <laughs> from off of the menu uh, just so that you will, I don't know, get a feel for what uh, the restaurant has to offer. But, you know, I also had, I think it was there. It was there. I think it was a yeah. It was an omelet. It was a Denver omelet, and I don't know. It was a nice uh, size omelet too. I mean, I think it. I'm gonna say it compares to another place that I've gone to or that I, I've talked about in the past, 
uh, two other places I'll say uh, one is coffee cup another is magnolias but uh, yeah the eggs were done just right eggs and uh, the cheese in the middle is cheddar cheese and bell peppers red bell peppers that were uh, kind of sauteed along with some onions it was just very simple very just straightforward uh, Denver omelet which was just perfect uh, you know, normally I would get maybe like a, a eggs benedict but I wanted something different um, that morning so you know french toast Denver omelet uh, Warren had ricotta um, pancakes, but he had another dish too. And I, I tell you, I cannot recall the name only because it's not on their menu. <laughs> I think they were either having a special. Nope, I found it. Ha <laughs> ha! It is the Parmesan herb Dutch baby, and I have not seen anything like this before. Um, it was prosciutto with. Um, the sunny side uh, up eggs and chives and underneath I I'm not sure what you know if anybody's ever had a Dutch baby you probably already know that there's uh, there's it's like some type of pastry or something that's underneath I, I it's like a I want to say like a, a huge over uh, over risen Panna Kuchen, <laughs> probably. I I don't know, <laughs> but it's almost like a pancake because it really it was like a it was really light and fluffy and it puffs up. Uh, it's a lot of times it's lightly brown. I'm looking online right now and it's a Dutch baby. It's a Dutch baby pancake. Dutch baby pancake. It's sometimes called a German pancake or a Bismarck or uh, maybe just a Dutch um, puff. Um, but it's normally served for breakfast and and like I said it's like a it's almost like a pan of kuchen. <laughs> nice anyway this was really good as well and even though he didn't have an opportunity to eat a lot of it uh, he took it home uh, gosh the sunny side up eggs and then the prosciutto that came along with it uh, again, photos will be available for you to see, and it was some good stuff. I, I'll just say there are so many other different items that are on their on their menu that I'm interested in having, and I find myself going, you know, planning to go back there. They have ro rotisserie chicken. That seems to be one of the major uh, items, if you would, that they prepare there at uh, 400 tavern uh, and when you go in it's a wide open space um, really great I think it's a great place to have maybe like if you're having a party uh, or just just you know gathering with friends um, it, it's a real nice place for you to go to and you know they do advertise that you have the opportunity to have a, like a private room uh, and you know, a few of your friends get together and just, I'll just say chill. I mean, it, it's it's a cool place. Uh, when Let me see. When you're going towards the back or towards the kitchen, um, you'll see immediately two major things. Roast, the chicken roasted roasting uh, or the rotisserie chicken being prepared in the stand-up ovens that they have available but also uh, uh, pizza goodness uh, oven just right there readily available I'm dry mouth I don't know why um, uh, for pizza or uh, oven specifically for pizza uh, so you, it, it's, you know how you go into a restaurant and it just the aroma of any type of food cooking, of course, just permeates the place, not overwhelmingly, but nicely. And because it's so far in the back, I mean, you do have to go like further back to really get that, okay, I see and smell chicken or something, wood fired grill. 
uh, or oven, excuse me, is, you know, up and operating, <laughs> uh, but it's way in the back. But you, you know, in when you're entering the restaurant or the tavern, uh, you get that hint of that aroma just slowly greeting you at the door. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of place it is. I mean, they have, you know, definitely they have cocktails, you know, adult beverages and so forth and um, juice, milk, so on, the, the standard things. But again, what I paid more attention to is the fact that, you know, their rotisserie chicken, a number of their items on their, you know, lunch, as well as their dinner menu talks about rotisserie chicken. And, you know, there's a rotisserie chicken sandwich uh, that has arugula, smoked tomato aioli uh, and provolone. And that's on a uh, on a roll with um, chicken au jus. Uh, and then there's rotisserie chicken Alfredo. Um, that comes with also peas and mushrooms, uh, and then uh, a salad, a rotisserie chicken cob, um, that's Boston lettuce, um, roasted chicken, bacon, avocado, uh, egg, um, blue cheese, and then uh, brown derby dressing. And I would only I could only say that you have to go and check them out. Um, again, they offer a Sunday brunch. Sunday brunch is from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. every Sunday. And then their hours, just their general hours and so forth, um, that is Monday through Thursday from 6.30 a.m. to 11 p.m. And then Fridays uh, through Sunday, uh, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Once again, that is Twin Cities 400 Tavern. Um, that is located at 1330 uh, Industrial Boulevard Northeast. Uh, and that's Minneapolis. Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55413. So, there you have it. That's one particular place. Uh, and remember, I, I, I encourage you, especially if you like uh, Panna uh have their Dutch, you know, that Dutch boy or that Dutch baby. <laughs> mm. On to the next uh, subject, if you would. And you know, I was, you know, I've talked in the past about food halls. I am really excited about all the different food halls that are gonna be opening, that are gonna be constructed, or that uh, currently, are, they're either in talks, uh, or you could see already different uh, development occurring. Um, even ones that are are open right now. It's interesting that in doing my research, and I can't remember, I don't believe I talked about it, but I learned something new about um, food halls. And I want to share that with you. Um, there are like three different types of food halls. And I'll, I'll let me explain uh, what I mean by that, because um, you know I've talked about food halls in the past and uh, what they are, where they're located, and what's being offered within each of you know food halls, or even ones that um, we are very familiar with, like um, Midtown Global Market, uh, newer ones like uh, Market House Collaborative, Keg and Case, those ones that are in St. Paul. Um, but then we have others that are up and coming as well, um, specifically. Um, Malcolm Yards Market and Dayton's Market. So those are what four or five that I've already already mentioned. But going back to the topic of the three different types of food halls there are. First, uh, we have to consider the square footage of a food hall, uh, and that will then determine the different types that are. The categories that they would actually fall under. So the first one, interesting, interestingly enough, is a food hall um, that is less than 10,000 square feet in size is referred to as a micro food hall. And that micro is, that, that type of food hall really is just kind of like for maybe a building, possibly. Um, it covers, you know, maybe the residents of that building and very, very small 
um, yeah, very small. Uh, but it will offer maybe one or two, um, diff maybe two or three actually, um, different vendors or types of food places or vendors that uh, are there that, uh, you know, residents in the building and maybe visitors that are coming to see folks in the building, uh, they could go and have some food, participate in maybe purchasing some items or whatnot. Um, yeah, uh, that's referred to as a micro food hall. Now, the next step up or the next size up, which is one ones that we're really familiar with, too. Um, if the square footage is from is greater than 10,000 up to 30,000 square feet, that's referred to as a neighborhood food hall. Uh, neighborhood food halls, that's one where it, just like what it sounds, it's within the neighborhood. Um, individuals you know are actually individuals people are actually they're willing to walk a, a, a i don't know a brief distance to actually get to a neighborhood food hall um yes true enough people will still drive and whatnot if they are familiar or not familiar with uh, where it's located um but still it covers the neighborhood you know Five minute, ten minute walking distance, I believe, is what they've described it as. Um, you know, for people that are willing to travel by foot or by car uh, to get to a uh, a food hall of that size. Again, neighborhood food hall. The last, uh, much larger category. Uh, this one, any food hall that has. A square footage greater than 30,000 square feet is referred to as a destination food hall. And uh, again, I mentioned that because, you know, I've already talked about the different food halls or I mentioned the different food halls that um, are either currently recently opened uh, with plans, uh, other others with plans of um, development, construction and so forth. Um, but one of the major ones uh, that I mentioned previously was Dayton's, uh, and that of course is um, you know, a very popular uh, chef and food enthusiast, uh, Andrew Zimmerman, is actually partnering with another with a construction company. His company is partnering with a construction company, I should say, and bringing to Minneapolis specifically in the Dayton's building uh, a food hall that is estimated to be 40,000 square feet so that right there destination and destination um, people are willing to drive for a, a certain distance or not even a certain distance the fact that they are actually driving to uh, some place where they are going to have a wide option of various vendors and foods and marketplace basically to choose from and to go to uh, that is the destination uh, food hall so keep those in mind um, the next time that you go are going to maybe a food hall um, maybe you may not even know it's a food hall but I'm just saying um, there are three different types uh, and you could certainly find out, you could really just look and see, okay, this is a neighborhood food hall. A destination food hall, um, I'll give you an example. Um, well, I wouldn't really say, consider like M, um, the Mall of America, MOA. That is a destination tourist spot, if you would. I mean, people come up from out of town and they're like, we want to go to the mall. And, you know, they don't want to go to Rosedale, even though Rosedale is nice, uh, or Southdale or some other mall. They want to go to <laughs> MOA. We need to go to Mall of America. <laughs> you know, that's uh, for them. That's the destination type of, you know, visit activity. Well, likewise, you know, when a destination food hall is going to be open, people are going to really want to come for miles to go to it. Uh, 
I realized that when I was in Los Angeles, well, you know, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, but there was a place called Grand Central Market. And, you know, being younger, you never really understood. You just knew that, you know, we're going downtown, downtown Los Angeles, and we're going to this place where we could get a whole lot of food. Yeah. Uh, that, that's what we thought. <laughs> we didn't know any better. But come to realize, you know, early or later on in years and more recently with you know, my research of food halls and just food in general, um, I realized that that was actually a food hall and it recently celebrated 100 years of being in operation. I mean, it has been around for since the 18, like 1879, if I recall correctly. Uh, was the time that it was established and it was established so that business folks uh, that were in the downtown area they always had an opportunity to run out and grab something to eat from the market and that is still really the premise today it has not changed Uh, and so when i came to minnesota i didn't really I, i didn't know what to expect but you know it was awesome me personally thinking that you know midtown global market uh it was it reminded me of that because it offered so many different variety of foods uh grand central market my main thing when we went there was to have you know uh, tacos or burritos um yeah you could get fruits and vegetables and uh, flowers and and so many other things you know at times even like seasonings or spices that you couldn't get at the grocery store or couldn't find at the grocery store you go down to downtown uh, to go to grand central market well I, I think of you know midtown global market very very similar um, again because of all the variety of types of uh, cuisines that are there plus um, the various vendors that are you know from different nationalities um, or cultures that are you know offering a little bit uh, a taste of their their culture and bringing it to individuals that are either familiar or maybe just are trying to learn about it um, I love that I really really do um, I talked about you know these others these other food halls but there is one specifically that I gotta say that you know, I had the opportunity of I'd say going to <laughs> well not going to no 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 not going to but con having a conversation <laughs> written conversation that is and and that's Malcolm Yard Market and you could recall that I have talked about that in the past but I found out a little bit more uh, uh information um I you know reached out to I believe it was a representative for Malcolm Yards Market, which is going to be a a new food hall that is going to be coming. Um, They are, I'll give you some, I'll let you know what's a few of the questions that I asked the representative and, you know, their reply, you know, for one, I asked them specifically, what was the estimated square footage? Now, keep in mind that, um, what I mentioned before and the reason why I mentioned it is because I'm talking about this Uh, the square footage for Malcolm Yards uh, market is going to be 16,000 16,500 square feet so that is going to that falls within the range of the neighborhood uh, uh, type or category for a food hall but that's just the food hall itself the overall area that they are developing is about 17 acres um, that is going to offer some really innovative um, development Uh, and that was really exciting to hear they had artist conception um, of what the area is supposed to look like Um, and you know currently you know their website if you want to find a little bit more information about them uh, you can um, learn more by going to malcolmyardsmarket.com www.malcolmyards.com uh, 
uh, and again find out specifically where they're going to be which is in the prospect park area uh, their address location first off um, if you know where the I, I like to say the United Crushers silos are so the Harris uh, Machinery Company building uh, one that was established in 1890 yeah it's going to be there um, specifically the address is 501 30th Avenue Southeast and that's in Minneapolis uh, and again doing research uh, for Malcolm Yards Market I found out that that area Prospect Park is pretty much considered a food desert uh, and even though it's near you know the University of Minnesota there are really no adequate places that the neighborhood can really go to within the immediate neighborhood to really get nutritious foods um, I mean you know really going like a, a really great farmers market uh, or just having a meal that does not have to be fried <laughs> or yeah <laughs> but here Malcolm Yards is looking to change that uh, they are going to be providing really unique flavors and styles in the area and probably thinking okay well what type of cuisine are they going to be offering well that was one of the questions that I I asked um, you know what type of cuisines are you going to be offering um, your consumers uh, and so, you know, the representative indicated that they were talking to a number of different chefs and and restaurant owners that are interested in becoming vendors. So ones like pastries, uh, wood fired pizza, ramen, um, Korean, Thai food. Those are just examples of the type of foods that they're hoping to offer. And when asked, well, what, uh, you know, should the neighborhood actually expect? Uh, from Malcolm Yards in their community, uh, you know, it's going to be a urban neighborhood food hall, and it's going to have approximately twelve, you know, food vendors, uh, as well as a central full bar. Uh, it'll be open seven days a week. It's going to offer guests a wide variety of fresh gourmet fast foods uh, from different chefs and food establishments. Um, you know, that'll also include craft beers, wines, you know cocktails for adults and so forth um, it's really convenient because you know it's right by the light rail um, I mean the 29th Avenue um, light rail stop you know you'll have an opportunity to get off um, and literally walk <laughs> uh, the distance not even a distance I won't even say that just along the Greenway or uh, to get to Malcolm Yards uh, so it's going to be a place that they'll have a lot of activities for families. Uh, if you just want to hang out, um, you could certainly go there. On the website, admittedly, they indicated that they were going to be, it was going to be coming in 2018. And I think I had even mentioned that as well, um, that you know, they stated that they were going to be um, 2018 is when it was going to be coming but apparently that there's been a little bit of an update so you know they're looking for an opening time frame of about spring of 2019 and you know it, it will still be in development you'll still see that ongoing so you never know I, I thought for certain you know when I did the research before um, it was saying that it was going to be open spring or summer um, of 2018 but that's fine you know uh, we want good quality uh, a establishment that's going to be of good quality and that is going to have vendors that are going to to stay so if you have to push out things sometimes to make sure things are done correctly and right hey that's what you have to do um, you know I, I wondered what I've always wondered what other food halls probably think of other food halls <laughs> um, or what their initial 
thought is in creating a food hall for a neighborhood, for a destination and whatnot. Um, and we know that food halls, they really have become a place for offering uh, a lot of, at times, high-end uh, foods um, and providing atmosphere. Um, you, you could go there in a small group or even in large groups. Um, I, I forgot about um, 7th Street Truck Yard. That's also another example of, uh, of a food hall. That is um, most definitely a neighborhood one as well. Um, but again, I, that quickly came to me because I was thinking small group, large groups as well. Um, but they could order just like there and many others. You could order a variety of different uh, foods uh, and different, you know, from different uh, cultures. You could meet up with people, um, have beverages. And I think it's important to about that community community eating or, or sitting um, where maybe it's big long tables and groups of people are able to sit you know at different sections but sometimes you know you're able to entertain meeting somebody new find out what where did they get that from or you never know it's an atmosphere that offers people the opportunity to socialize in you know a central space without being all secluded in booths uh, or you know, individual tables um, a lot of times food halls are going to be offering uh, some type of music or entertainment again a great example of that is midtown global market i think on saturdays and sundays um, and even sometimes during the week um, like lunchtime or something there might be some type of artist uh, or music that is actually being presented and played um, or entertainment like on Sundays I think they have um, you know there is a dance instructor uh, that offers salsa I mean or, or other uh, different type of dance styles available so you know people getting together and experiencing uh, each other different people you know they attract people you know from different neighborhoods uh, and different cultures and getting them together in one specific space you know, it's it's a new experience for some folks because um, you know even with foods being so exciting you want to get out with a group of people rather than just experiencing it just by yourself sometimes uh, and because you want to see those different experiences from other people, um, being in a food hall offers that. Uh, and what a, what better way than to um, be able to, I don't know, get to know your neighbor <laughs> or something, you know, why not? Uh, as a foodie, you're probably wondering, OK, well, don't foodies always like to take pictures or well, I'm always seeing somebody with their camera or, or something. Yeah, that's very true. Very, very true. And places like food halls or cl market collaboratives, honestly, I feel is a is a foodies paradise. You know, um, any place really that offers really good food and drinks, it's a foodies paradise. But, you know. If you're at a food hall, I'm mean, like, seriously, you have, it's not like you have to go to restaurant to restaurant to restaurant, you know, going across different areas of the city. You're in one specific place, a generalized place uh, where, hey, I'm just going to go about 50, 60 feet. <laughs> I'm going to go get this cuisine and then come back. Yeah, people are going to be like, how many restaurants have you gone to today? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. And so, you know, I, I really want to thank the, uh, I, I really want to thank, uh, and I'll say the representative's name, uh, Patricia Wall. Thank you so much, your representative from Malcolm Yards Market, uh, in providing us some, just answering a few questions that I had in reference to um, what we the community should expect uh, for or from Malcolm Yards Market. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention in reference to Malcolm Yards, though, because I asked her as well, is this going to be or will there be an opportunity to have 
uh, a farmer's market. And you know how much I talk about farmer's markets or oftentimes I'm talking about farmer's markets and folks going out to, uh, to support their local farmer's market. Um, because we they're trying to address um, the Prospect Park area, you know, being a food desert and that's the reason why they're creating this space, um, you know, they confirmed that yes, there will be an opportunity for farmers markets, um, you know, to take advantage of, you know, the you know the space that they have available. So, I, I mean, of course, I, there was no details or anything that were provided, but still, um, fact remains, uh, with such a large area uh, offering. You know, a place for people to come and congregate and enjoy really great food. Um, what better place than to also offer them an opportunity to get, uh, you know, nutritious foods and fruits, vegetables, um, you know, in another area of the city. So, yeah, hats off to Malcolm Yards Market and your development of that area. Greatly appreciated. Uh, as we go into you know, later parts of the show, once again, I uh, don't want to forget um, my audience out there. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember that you have an opportunity to uh, listen to the show uh, later at a later time. Um, it will be available um, for your convenient listening pleasure. Uh, although live right now, uh, still, you know, it, they are recorded. My shows are recorded and so forth. So we want to make sure that uh, they are available for you to k- get caught up on. Um, maybe find out a point or two or a new restaurant that's in your area that you were not familiar with. Um, so make sure that if you'd like, <laughs> please visit uh, www.theunbougiefoodie.com so that you could get caught up with uh you know, the various shows, uh, as well as different articles that I've written for a community uh, newspaper um, within the Twin Cities. Uh, I would love to hear from anyone that has maybe a suggestion of a new place uh, that um, maybe we should visit, go to. Um, There are a number of restaurants that I mentioned like last week that are going to be opening up and uh, even some within the past week and just conversations people are talking about what's going to be available and I just thought okay well hey here's your opportunity you, know, you can always call in and let us know uh, what your thoughts are so 651-200-3479 uh, once again 651-200-3479 that will give you an opportunity to hey share in uh, the conversation uh and you could certainly you know you voice your opinion you you too can be the voice of the east side or help in being the voice of the east side as well i i love uh just being able to give people opportunity to share their their thoughts um on you know, new places. Hello, this show is really about sharing. You know, that's what I'm always going to try to do. There were one or two, um, I guess, new ideas. Um, I think I'll probably talk about one of them. Um, I think it was how to get, you've had salmon probably before. Uh, and you're probably thinking, okay, well, I, I like salmon, but I don't like to cook it at home. And you're like, okay, I, 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 I only not, I only know how to possibly <laughs> uh, pan fry, uh, and then it gets a, a bit dry, or maybe you don't cook it enough, and or, or you put too much, there's too much liquid, or or whatnot. Anyway. There is uh, apparently an article that is entitled 
uh, master the chemistry of a juicy, tender salmon. Um, so it talks about that, you know, you might thinking that brining, uh, you know, fish is just specific to poultry or maybe for pickling. Um, but the mechanics works for fish as well. And I was not aware of that, believe it or not. I was not aware of that um, because I'm thinking, you know, too much salt, uh, you know, or it might taste different. But it is the salt in the water um, when you have enough or just enough it helps permeate the cell walls of the salmon fillet um, so it helps with that process of as they refer to as osmosis the breakdown process um, you know the cells have a lower concentration um, of salt than brine so water rushes out of those cells um, and then salt is able to flow in um, that then makes the water uh, it balances it a bit um, so it helps increase the amount of liquid as well as the amount of flavor that's inside the meat uh, and we all you know we're dealing with fish we know that it can become somewhat waterlogged um, but you know you you want your voice your your fish to be moist uh, I think folks will be much more happier with saying oh yeah my fish was it was moist or I mean, you, of course, you're not going to say raw. No, but the bad end is my fish was dry. You never want to hear anyone say anything about my fish was being dry or it wasn't moist enough. Um, there are certain types of, you know, because we're talking about salmon, there are certain types of salmon, of course, that they might take to that brining process. Uh a lot faster um, wild and farm salmon they aren't very dense and so they are going to absorb all of that that brine so brine well we could talk about brine at another time um, you know there are various different types of ways to do brining and you know when it comes down to meat um, poultry and so forth and here we're talking about fish so there are various types but We'll, again, we'll talk about that another time. Another subject for us to talk about on this Unbuji Foodie. They, if wild and farm um, salmon, they're not very dense. Um, so they are going to absorb that brine a whole lot faster. Um, I think they mentioned that it's 15 minutes for a brine to be truly effective. Uh, the main difference between, however, farmed and wild salmon is the fat content. Um, you could get really great cuts, um, you know, you know, from different varieties. Um, if you know, if you're going to cook them differently, um, farm varieties have uh, three times as much fat as wild. Uh, wild uh, salmon or fillets, uh, they have more collagen. Um, and that's the protein that gives the meat its structure and holds the, fa on the fibers together. Uh, but so keep in mind that there is nothing wrong with brining your fish. Um, and, you know, just again, very short amount of time. Um, you know what? They again said 15 minutes. It does not take very long to just do that process to make sure that your fish uh, stays moist. So this information i'll make sure to have out on the website or make reference to it um out on my website the unbougiefoodie.com um i and again you know it's surprising that this was a subject that came from uh i guess a publication that talks a lot about oh, from my standpoint where i've always thought of it it's always talking about technology Believe it or not, this is really very, but, you know, it, considering that it is science based, um, why not talk about food, you know, preparing foods or there is a science at times about preparing food. So the publication is wired.com. Uh, and again, I will make reference to that. But the title of the article is Master the Chemistry of Juicy Tender Salmon. So thank you Wired for providing us with that information.
That's surprising. Actually, very surprising. Gosh, where has the time gone? Uh, once again, I want to take this time to just encourage you. Hey, you still have time if you'd like to give me a call in uh, 651-200-3479. Uh, if you have a, a comment that you'd like to make uh, in reference to the show, and maybe an input, uh, a suggestion and then about a restaurant or your favorite spot. You know, this is also a place where we share recipes as well. I haven't shared a recipe in a while, so I'll, I'll change that. But just know that uh, it's an interchange between myself and listeners that share that commonality of love for food. So I want to definitely encourage you to always feel free to contact me uh, through any of my mo my uh, social media. And just I'll mention those again. Uh, there is Facebook. You could find me at the Unbuji Foodie. Um, you know, every day. Well, not every day. You'll see certain things from me. Because, <laughs> um, you know, we have other responsibilities in life as well. So this is definitely my passion and my love. So. But there are other things that I have to do to pay the bills. <laughs> so, yes, there's a secular job in, uh, in my day-to-day -day life. Uh, but uh, Instagram is the underscore unbougie foodie. Twitter is at unbougie foodie. Uh, email is also a way that you could get in contact with me. And I, I really would love to hear... Um, stories, other people's stories about um, their food experiences. Um, you know, the articles that I write for that community newspaper that I've referenced, um, I that's what I try to do. I try to tell a story about either an experience in my life or um, and related to the food. Um, it's uh, it really is always related to food, of course. But, you know, sometimes there was an experience that, you know, I can recall uh, when considering cooking a meal or being with my family. Uh, so I, I want to hear those stories from you all as well, from listeners that are out there um, that are willing to share. Um, again, you don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be on air. That's fine. You could always uh, drop me a line at the un unbougiefoodie at gmail.com and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, information about your food stories um, about interchange yeah thank you all so much for uh, tuning in uh, today next week we'll have a different subject um, I am looking for, I would really love to have a conversation with, it's a subject I know that I've talked on and I've even mentioned it. it's a very serious, serious subject, but I really have not had an opportunity to talk to a female chef and I would like to find out their viewpoint on things that are actually occurring right now in our, the atmosphere, the environment um, that we have. Um, you know, a recent article that I've written for well, a community newspaper, um, it talked on the subject of harassment. And though I'm not purposely ending on a, a negative note, um, I think it's a subject that needs to be addressed. And I would really enjoy an opportunity uh, to find a female chef or um, a woman culinary professional <laughs> if you would uh, and have a conversation with her so if friends if you know anyone out there that would be interested in having you know a conversation coming on the show and sharing uh, you know the booth or with me I would really appreciate it ask them to get in contact with uh, the unbougie foodie at gmail.com uh, or just to reach out to me on through any of my social media um so that we can have that conversation. Um, I feel it's something that still needs to be 
talked about, um, especially when it, you know, it's not just, you know, celebrities or it's happening so many different places and in various professions, uh, I guess, you know, these are just places where you're thinking that, gosh, that shouldn't be happening. I, you know, from a food standpoint or food lover's standpoint, um, never really think that of about that. You think about, is my food going to come out correctly? Um, are they going to, you know, is my meat going to be cooked properly? Is my fish, my fish, fish, is my fish uh, going to come out, you know, moist and flaky? And But then there is the back, story if you would or the the kitchen confidentials almost that you have to consider that you think about and you're like wow I I guess I never really thought about that you know going into a restaurant uh, I'm just thinking about you know can I get a good table or will I get seated you know in less than half an hour or 45 minutes um, what what consideration are we giving to those uh, experiences that are happening behind the scenes that we're not truly aware of? Um, that needs to be a conversation had. So once again, if there's anyone out there, um, I would really uh, appreciate an opportunity to have a conversation with um, a culinary professional that is a woman um, or a man that feels strongly about um, showing that respect in the kitchen or in the culinary pro- culinary world, um, since it is a topic that has been brought up or has basically been presented to us in so much, so strongly right now. Once again, I want to thank you all so much for tuning in. This has been another wonderful and successful uh, show at the Unbuji Foodie. I'm here, your host. Um, so thank you. And as always, uh, I want to encourage you never to let anyone tell you what type of foodie to be, because really, it is all about the food.